Hi, everyone. My name is Kirk Bachman, and welcome back to The Ultimate Dish. In today's episode, we're speaking with Escoffier chef instructor, Steve Konopelski, a classically trained ballet dancer turned pastry chef. Steve had a successful 11-year career as a Broadway dancer before turning his sights to culinary school. Graduating top of his class at the French Culinary Institute, Steve went on to work for top New York restaurants, own his own pastry businesses, and launch a YouTube show. Today, Steve keeps busy with his YouTube baking show, The Sweet Life of Steve, and empowering aspiring culinarians as an online Escoffier chef instructor. Join us today as we chat with Steve about embracing change and being unapologetic. And there he is. Welcome, chef. How are you? I am great, chef. Thank you so, so much. What a wonderful introduction. One of my favorite topics. Please. I'm out of, you, <laughs> remarkable me, I'm out of breath. You, hey, before we even dive in, yours is such an interesting story. I'm super excited. I'm a little nervous about getting upstage, but that's okay. That's okay. If you start singing, I'm out. Okay. 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 All right. But I, why are you unapologetic? You know, I think it's, it's taken me a long time to sort of realize the wonderful power that each one of us has. You know, when you really stop and think about it, no one else in recorded human history has had the same life track as you. Maybe we have similar experiences, you know, we can appreciate and empathize with each other, but nobody else has had the exact same life path as yourself or myself. And when you really, really recognize that and own that and kind of go, hey, I am so unique and special. And when you embrace that, you understand you have so much to offer to the world because there is nobody else like you, you're it. I absolutely love that. And I'm 100% shamelessly stealing that as a parent of youngsters. What a beautiful, beautiful message, right? This day and age when self-esteem is so important, people are watching stuff uh, online all the time and wondering, you know, why can't, can't I, why can't I? I absolutely love that. How, um, by the way, is um, 2022 treating you so far? You know, I'm actually kind of really digging 2022. Um, it's it's new. It's different. You know, we're still in like a weird COVID-y, who knows what. We're hesitant a little bit, right? We're, we're yeah. hesitant. And at the same time, it's sort of this kind of little like je ne sais quoi, Jacques Cousteau, voyage of discovery <laughs> type of situation. It's like, what does the world going to offer today? Who knows? I love it. I love it. What an amazing, um, honestly, I've been watching you on YouTube for, for a few days now. What, what an amazing and, um, you know, interesting story. You're a graduate of the professional division of the Royal Winnipeg Ballet. Absolutely. Wow. And then, and then worked on Broadway yeah. as, as a dancer for 11 years. And like we talked about earlier, that's a career, by the way, yeah. that's a career. So 11 years on Broadway. Um, <laughs> I have to ask. So what is that in entertainers years? And that's a lot of wear and tear on the body. So what's, what's the multiple? Is it, is it more Ooh. like 40 years? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I think so. I think, it, I think we can definitely at least call it like a quarter lifetime. So let's, let's round up to 25. I think that that's a pretty acceptable kind of situation, but also I started dancing when I was eight years old. Okay. And that okay. was essentially my life up until I was years old sure. when I had, <laughs> had, you know, decided to retire. So I came with all of just this, you know, this, this juvenile experience of, you know, that eight to 18 kind of situation of training. So many of when I was in the industry, my fellow, you know, um, performers were people that like picked up dancing in college, you know, or maybe they started their first dance class at like 15 or 16. I already had 10 years ahead of them just in training. So by the time I was, you know, 30 and, um, oh, guess I, darn it. I, I, I ruined it. We can edit uh, that. We so, can edit you that. know, yeah. by the time I was there, <laughs> I already had 10 years plus ahead of everybody else. So sort of my like longevity fatigue thing was kicking in even more. And then you throw like, you know, professional ballet school on top of that, where that was like 
12 hours a day, six days a week. Like that was an intense lifetime within itself. Like ballet dancers longevity is even shorter than, you know, like musical theater performers, because just the, like the pounding on your joints is like, I, forget I, about it. I imagine. Um, and, and where are you from, Shep? I am originally from Saskatchewan, Canada. Okay. okay. Um, town of Rabbit Lake, population 92. Ooh. And, and I didn't even hockey. live in the town. <laughs> I'm like 20 minutes outside of the okay. town, like just Very... the middle legit of nowhere. <laughs> So fast forward from that rural sort of upbringing, um, hockey centric country, right, to to Broadway. What? And I know this isn't on the script. I'm just fascinated by the story. We, we ha you have to share a little bit. What what was that like, young person in a in a in, a, in the biggest city in the United States? Um, that moment that I like got off the plane in New York. And here's the other thing. I bought my one-way, non-refundable, non-transferable ticket to move to New York City, September 10th, 2001. No, no. Yes. So the next day, the world changed forever. Indeed. And I'm having this moment of like, I'm about to move to, you know, like literally ground zero. And that is this the right decision? That little bit of panic, that little bit of fear, you know, everybody was like, oh, New York is going to be so different. I had never been to New York. So for me, I don't know what pre 9-11 New York ever felt like. And then New York changed again. And then New yeah. York changed again. Um, and so my, my flight was September 26th, 2001. There is still smoke going. Yeah. There is still everything. And I flew into LaGuardia, the bus depot of airports. <laughs> um, I get off the plane. Everything I own is in two suitcases and a carry-on bag. I've got $1,000 in my bank account thinking, I'm here, I'm going to make it. You know, I, I get into the line for the cab. The cabbie comes up, he pulls up, throws my suitcases in the bag. That's when I notice he's got one leg. He is driving me across like the bridge into Manhattan with his good foot on the brakes and his crutch on the gas. And I'm thinking to myself, this is New York. <laughs> this, is, this is the thing, you know. And I wasn't, I wasn't scared. I wasn't scared at all because I had been raised with this sort of sense of adventure. But I also had, and, 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 and here, we're, we're going there. My entire life up until that point, except for really my parents, I had the world telling me that I couldn't do it. You know, I had just... Everybody was like this, you can't, you're never, you're this farm kid from the middle of nowhere. You're never going to make it in New York. You're never going to, you're never going to become a dancer. Why? Like time and time again, it was this constant barrage of you're not good enough. You're never going to succeed. Small town kids don't do this. You know, farm kids don't do this, blah, 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 blah. And so there was almost this other sense of, oh, really? Watch me try and watch me prove you all wrong. And in hindsight, looking back at that, if I hadn't had that, I don't know if I would have been the strong person that I am now. Because whenever you are faced with adversity, that's when we grow. We grow under adversity. The best, prettiest things in the world come out of places where they shouldn't come from. You know, Such diamonds, great advice. Such great advice for students. Diamonds exist because of, you know, uh, they exist because of hardship and stress and everything, you know, the strongest trees in the forest are the ones that had to grow through all of the stuff. And so anytime it felt like, you know, how's it going to go? One reflection of somebody saying you're not good enough. And that's just sort of the kick in the butt that you need. And so it was, it was that acceptance, the world is my oyster kind of thing. Yes, it was scary. You know, I knew literally one person in Manhattan. Um, but I had this whole new world to explore. And I just, I was like, I'm taking, I'm not taking any moment for granted. I'm just sort of taking this all in. And I'm going to put my best foot forward. And I'm going to see what happens. Well, and, and you were all in. The, the, the piece that got me right away was the one-way ticket. Was that you or was that your parents encouraging you? You're going to go to New York. You're going to make it. And you'll come back when you want to come back. I think that was actually my bank account. Um, 
that's the one that determined the one way ticket. I could get there. I could get there. Okay. I you know I can get there. I don't know if I can get home. Um, <laughs> it was very thoroughly modern, Millie. You know, like it, for for anybody who gets the reference. Um, <laughs> but I th I think maybe subconsciously there was also that sort of situation of if I buy a return ticket then I've already created a plan B for myself. Yeah. And yeah. this is not a plan B option. This is a plan A and we're going to make it work no matter, no matter what happens. And so probably I think subconsciously it's like, no. And there also was this part based on all of that stuff that I was coming from. I didn't want to come back. Greatest moment as a dancer? Oh, ugh. I had... I have, I've had a lot of them, you know, I've been, I was fortunate enough, obviously to, you know, kind of to perform on Broadway. My Broadway debut was really, really cool because it was just kind of like that, you know, it, it was, it was so fairy tale. It was so TV. It was so everything, you know, you were there. Up. You were I was there. there. Yeah. Um, but Broadway debut is kind of a little bit ruined because, you know, you have previews always before that and you have that you're rehearsing on the stage. So the first time on the Broadway stage is like a month and a half before the show actually, you know, goes up or whatever. I think for me, one of my absolute favorite moments was when I did the Radio City Christmas Spectacular. I mean, the Radio City Music Hall is the... I just got a know. chill. Yeah. <laughs> wow. wow. When that curtain goes up, it's like you're playing to the Grand Canyon. It is just this... Vo you see like 12 faces in the front and then the rest is just this sort of sea of black. And the stage is like the size of a football field, both across and deep. Um, it, I had been auditioning for that job for four years. Wow. And... Uh, Every year they're like, oh, we love you. Can we send you out to Tennessee? And I'm like, no, it's like New York stage or nothing. And then finally the year, the call came and it's like, we have a spot for you in the New York stage. And I was like, done. When that curtain went up, that was, it was, it was such an amazing, amazing moment. Oh, I loved, loved being a part of that. So, so try to paint a picture. Um, any, we're going to talk culinary here in a moment, or baking, pastry when you mentioned the curtain goes up grand canyon in front of you did did you ever have a moment where you walked out of the kitchen or or out of the bakery to where the guests were and felt the same way that oh my there he is there he is <laughs> <laughs> um yeah a, a lot uh, and i think maybe it's one of the reasons that I feel like I've had a very, very strong culinary career is because, it, you know, for those of you who have met me, um, you can take the, the Broadway or you can take the boy out of Broadway, but you can't take the Broadway out of the boy. And so when people ask me all the time, oh, do you miss performing or whatever? It's like, still performing. I'm still performing, <laughs> uh, you know, and that's, I think, an important part of like the culinary industry is we are creating art, we are creating show with food. And, you know, thinking about plating up, for example, it's kind of like you're telling a story. And that's theater, that's performing, that's all that kind of stuff. So I, when I first went to culinary school, I was petrified. You know, it took me five years to be brave enough to finally say, I'm going to retire for performing. I would like to do something else now. I've had a good career. And some of it was that I wasn't quite fulfilled, you know, in my career. And finally, I was like, I've done a lot of the things that I set out to do. And I am happy stepping away on my own terms instead of the industry saying, we're done with you. You have no place here anymore. I was the one to say, I have done what I set out to do and I'm happy and I'm content with myself. I love that. The, 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 the farm boy, right? No, no longer needed to worry about the return ticket. So, so not to cut you off, but I, let's fill in the gaps there. So when did you start thinking? Cause for me, it sort of makes sense based on your comments about theater and performing the, the segue completely obvious to me, it may not be to everyone. So take us through 
When did that become a thing? You're dancing, you're busy, you're wondering what the next step is. And then all of a sudden, French Culinary Institute, not just a culinary school, one of the premier culinary schools right there in New York, which in many ways, kind of a theater as well with all of the celebrities that were involved. Oh, so for sure. so walk, walk us through what that felt like. So um, I first started exploring the idea of culinary school kind of around 2007, 2008. That I think is when really like enter food entertainment television was at its peak. You know, that's when Food Network was like, ta-da. That's when we had not just education in food, but we had food entertainment, you know. There were shows, you know, Ace of Cakes, for example, or whatever. And there's, we're not learning sure, anything. Sure. We're being entertained by someone's talent and their skill set and the fact that they're, you know, an entertaining personality at the same time. So there's this actory part of me that's kind of seeing this. And I'm like, huh, okay, here's a whole performance that's based around food and, and whatever. And of course, this seems very, very appealing. And I love to bake. And it's something that I grew up with. I was fortunate enough to have one of those households, you know, being in the farm in the middle of nowhere, we made everything from scratch. You know, my mother sewed my clothes for crying out loud. I was one of those kids. <laughs> um, you know, we go on family vacation. All of us are in our matching hamburger shorts because that's the fabric that was on sale. That's another podcast. <laughs> that's another podcast altogether. So. <laughs> that idea was sort of there and kind of was something in the back of my head, but I didn't really start pursuing that um, until around 2010, because I had essentially almost an entire year in my career where the jobs weren't really coming. And it was kind of, you know, at that moment, you're like, well, maybe I need to pivot. Maybe I need to sort of think about something else. Do I want to keep doing that? Like, going out and auditioning and trying to find the next job is exhausting. It's physically exhausting and it's emotionally exhausting sure. because you're having people say, oh, you know, we love you, but you're just not right for this part because you're five, eight, you know, whatever. And we need someone who's five, 10. And then they tell you, don't take that personally. I can't not take that personally because if you tell me I'm not talented enough, I can work on that. I can grow. But if you tell me I'm too short, I was this height when I walked in the room six weeks ago for these auditions. Why are you dragging me through all this to tell me I'm too short at the end? That is emotionally exhausting. So 2010 is where really the exploration kind of came in. Uh, 2011 for me was a fantastic year. I think I worked pretty much nonstop uh, from January up until September. And at that time is also when my father was diagnosed with lymphoma. And I took a month off and I went home. I helped out on the farm, something I never did as a kid. You couldn't, I, I couldn't wait to get out of there. I went back, I, you know, I took my dad hand in hand. We're going to get the work done. And that was kind of the moment where it was like family, a real life is very, very important as well. And I had spent so much of my time, you know, my career was my life and that was the only thing. And I was like, there's more to life than just being married to a career. And that was the, the catalyst. And then speaking with my dad and kind of saying, I'm thinking about this. I've been doing this for a while. And as a kid, you, you never want to let your parents down. And my parents have supported me from day one. I mean, to have a, my dad grew up on a farm one mile away from our farm. My dad saw the ocean for the first time in his mid seventies. You know, th this is a man who experienced very little in his life and who every second was like, if you want to do this, you go out, don't look back, keep going, you know, and to have him go, I think maybe it is time to try something else. And no matter what you try, you're going to be good at. So just do it. And I was like, okay. And that was September and December is when I enrolled in French culinary. I, I love that story. Thank you for your <laughs> vulnerability, right? Sometimes it's just about our parents' love. That's it. It's all you need. Yeah. It's all you need, right? Or someone else. Maybe yeah. you don't yeah. have that parental figure, but you have a somebody who's, support and nourishment and uh, acceptance means the world to you. And when you get that person's blessing and then you grant yourself permission to give you that blessing, 
then it's just like, okay, great. Now the, now the world opens up again, kind of going back to what we talked about at that very beginning, unapologetically you granting yourself the permission to go, I'm doing something else now. So well said, so well said. How, how, how excited were you with your incredible electric personality when you were in, in that culinary school, that first day of class and it all started. Could, <laughs> were you jittery? Was it, was it crazy? I, it, it, it was crazy. It, you know, you're in the sea of everybody in their pristine white. Cause we'd only just opened the package like three days ago. I mean, yeah. you couldn't get any whiter <laughs> than those chef coats and, and your little, and your little toque and your little, um, kerchief situation thing yeah, you know yeah, you got the yeah. elastic band pants on which ps we need to change the school uniform because an elastic waistband the, the fashion is, is the tough. worst the fashion thing is tough. for for culinary school because you are going to gain 30 pounds in culinary school and not know it because the pants just keep expanding <laughs> well they set you up for it right they do <laughs> 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 so 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 the other just such a great conversation the, the other day we had a conversation with chef colette who know she's also a chef instructor at Escoffier with an in incredible history and, uh, and career. We talked about baking and pastry as an art or a science. And she said, and I quote, it's a science with art on top. And um, I love that. And, and I wrote it down. And, and I think, in, and, and chef, correct me if, I, if I'm wrong or this isn't the case, but ballet is, is a science first as well. I mean, the skill it takes to be a professional dancer, I imagine, is incredibly intense, right? A pirouette is a pirouette is a pirouette. You can either do it, whether you're 5'8 or 5'10, you can either do it or you cannot. And right. in a similar way, not to stress anyone out, but with baking, and I'm the son of a master pastry chef, right? With baking, it, it, honestly, even more so than savory cooking, you have to follow precise guidelines, measurements, formulas, and then you interpret later, right? Yes. Um, when, when you understand that the fundamentals are critical, even, even when you're making shoe paste on YouTube, right? It, it's not going to be shoe paste unless you follow the precision, right? So just, do you agree with that approach that it's a science with art on top? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, I 100% agree with that. It's something I tell the students all the time. As, as bakers, we're chemists first. We have this set of ingredients and we have a specific set of rules essentially that we need to follow, aka technique, in order to accomplish a desired outcome. And, you know, um, I want to tell this story. I don't know if we're going to go run out of time or whatever, but my first day of culinary school was petrifying because mostly I felt like I was losing my identity. You know, I, I started dancing when I was eight. It was the only thing I knew. I didn't go to college. I, didn't, I was dancer, dancer, dancer. That was my life. So essentially two thirds of my life by the time I was at culinary school, maybe more, was all dedicated to a dancer. And now all of a sudden I'm going to be chef Steve, not dancer Steve. And I did not know what to do with myself. You know, Colin, that first day was petrifying. And it just so happened that our instructor that day, who I never had again, was chef Tony. And chef Tony in her introduction told us that she had been a professional dancer with Alvin Ailey Ballet Company for X number of years before retiring. And so I went up to chef Tony afterwards and I was like, chef, I am really scared here. I don't know who I am. I'm a conservatory ballet kid turned Broadway performer and I've retired and I don't know who I am. I, I, how, how did you make this transition? And so she looked at me and she said, you're going to do amazing in this industry. And here's why. As a dancer, you understand the importance of muscle memory. As a dancer, you understand the fundamentals of technique and that you cannot do anything if you don't have a technical base first. You understand spatial awareness. You understand the importance of repetition. You understand the importance of seeing something and being able to replicate it. You have not changed. The kitchen is your new dance studio. And as soon as she said that, it was the lights clicked. And I was like, oh, I am not starting from zero. 
Every single thing that I've learned and worked so hard for my entire life to this point translates perfectly to the kitchen. It's just a different set of tools and the environment, you know, you know, like the environment changed a little bit, but otherwise it's the same. And from that moment on, culinary school was really easy. So she was right. Have, have you was, stayed in, in touch with Tony? And I, um, the last time I went up to New York, when the school was still open, I, I, I dropped in because I wanted to try to, to see any of, of yeah, my chefs. And yeah. unfortunately, none of them were there. But I did like leave messages for her and, and have been able to kind of communicate a little bit with her through like social media and stuff. Um, and that, I think, that understanding, like we've been talking about, that baking is a precision. It, there's a science there and there's technical skills. And the same thing as, as the culinary side as well. When you understand the technique, then you can play and you can do anything. But if you don't understand the technique first, you're very limited in what you can create. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Great, great, great advice. So, so here's a juxtaposition. So as someone who's, let's say, twice educated and now an educator yourself, how much, Chef, do you appreciate learning and building skills? And does your background... <laughs> make your expectations even higher for your students? Are you tough? <laughs> I, yes, I, I'm not. Well, yeah, okay, yeah. I'm tough, but I'm also incredibly fair because I understand, especially in our online format, that the variables for each student change. In a ground school, you all have the same oven. You have the same equipment. You're working on the same set of ingredients. But as like a remote student who's working in, in the comfort of their own kitchen with a varying degree of tools, opportunities, even a varying degree of availability of ingredients, I do take that into account. You know, butter is not butter all the way across the, you know, the board. cheaper butter is a little bit inferior to, you know, like a European style butter. If you're making a croissant, for example, we need that higher fat because it's more plastic and elastic than, you know, El Cheapo butter is. And if it's made, made with real butter, then we're really in trouble, right? You know, so um, I take that kind of stuff into consideration when I am looking at my students' um, assignments and I'm doing that grading. I also know because of what we talked about at the beginning, None of these students are on my life path. They're not on my track. My level of expectation is for me and me alone. And that's it. You know, I also know, and I, I, I would not fathom to have the audacity to expect every one of these students to have the same passion that I do. That's impossible. But what I hope to do is be infectious enough with my passion to help them finally find their own. And I will celebrate with them when they do. And if they haven't quite found it yet, I am confident in the fact that at some point in time, they will have this moment and be like, Chef Steve taught me this. And because of that, I am where I am now. And so that's unapologetic. That's yeah. the long yeah. game that we have to play as chefs. The aha moment might not come now, or is, is rather as chef instructors. That aha moment, and a lot of times it doesn't. The mm -hmm. aha moment comes much later, but we're the catalyst for the aha moment. And I count myself fortunate enough to have been a part of their specific personal and culinary journey. I love this topic. I want, I want to talk just a little bit more about the fear. Um, and, and it seems like you overcame that fear pretty quickly with Chef Tony. You connected, you had a similar background. Um, maybe just a couple additional comments about sometimes it's it's you know moving from one chef instructor that you're super comfortable with to a different chef instructor who doesn't you know, kind of fall in line with your expectations how, how primarily for the for the for the listening audience of students how, how do you manage one your expectations and then the potential fear of someone who does it just a little bit differently or doesn't know you um, fear of the unknown type of thing. Any, any advice for students around that? I think as long as you're always sort of doing your best, I don't think anyone can really honestly truly fault you for that, you know? Um, and your best today will be different than your best six months ago. 
Mm. And tomorrow's best is going to be even better than today's best. And so I think that's the approach that you need to have when you're coming into things. The other approach that you need to have is there's more than one way to put on a pair of pants. So your chef instructor at this moment may ask specific things of you and someone else is going to ask other specific things of you. Adaptability is one of the key things that we need to have in this culinary industry, regardless of if you're working for a James Beard person or you're the boss yourself. Adaptability, it just has to happen. Um, and so, you know, I remember going from, you know, the equivalent of pastry one to pastry two and having a brand new instructor. And my chef Joe that I had for pastry one, we, we spoke the same language, you know, whatever. I was the favorite student, da, 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 da. All of a sudden I moved and I'm working with chef Cynthia. And the first week I was like, I'm a delight. Why do you hate me? You know, kind of situation or whatever. But it's just chef Cynthia and I hadn't I hadn't learned to speak her language. I came sure, in sure. expecting her to speak mine, but it was her environment. Yeah, so it's I me, needed... it's Steve, it's Steve. Haven't you heard? <laughs> Haven't you heard? Don't you know? Everybody loves me. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm top of the class. What do you mean? Um, you know, I, so... I love how mise, mise, I, what I'm hearing, you know, mise en place is incredibly important in your, in your discipline. However, living in the moment is also important is what I'm hearing. You know, you, yes, you have to, you have to prepare and then you have to also prepare for the unknown. And I think Perfect. that's really honestly and truly what adaptability is. I heard once someone once say that coincidence is merely when opportunity meets preparation. Oh, love that. Love that for athletics, parenting or culinary school. I, <laughs> yes. I love it. So, so after culinary school, you worked in some you're a phenomenal New York restaurants, uh, including working with James Beard, winning pastry chef Claudia Fleming. Congratulations. I bet that was ah. fun. You, oh. have, you then pivoted. You had a bed and breakfast in Maryland, um, um, full full scale bakery, um, wedding cakes. So I'd, I'd love to hear uh, a little bit more about that, but sort of wrap it into what sort of advice would you give to someone today, knowing that they're different than you, <laughs> unapologetically, um, that wanted to do some of the same, work with somebody who's got a great reputation, make wedding cakes, do what makes them happy? Tough question. <laughs> it is a tough question. And um, my, my one big piece of advice, especially, is I think you have to play a long game. You know, okay. you okay. have to... We think of, especially as students, we think of mise en place as, um, you know, measuring up my ingredients and then I'm done. That is only like a part of mise en place. Mise en place truly is, what is every single step I need to take in order to accomplish the thing that I want to make? So you want to make a career for yourself. You want to open up this bakery. What is the mise en place for that? And a lot of that is going, what are the little individual skills that I need to learn in order to kind of create my thing? So when I got out of culinary school, I knew eventually I wanted to be the guy, I wanted to be my own boss. So I made sure to deliberately put myself in a restaurant environment, mostly to see like, is this what I still want to do? But plating up, you know, very quick type of stuff is a huge skill in of itself. Then I put myself into a big hotel environment, batch cooking. There's a really big difference in baking a cake for eight people and baking a cake for 9,000, you know. I needed that education. I put myself in a bakery atmosphere because I'm thinking I'm hopefully going to open a bakery one day. Hated it. The irony still gets me to this day. I was going to actually ask next <laughs> if you if you'd ever open a bakery again. Got that. Got that answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then um, the opportunity to, to work for Claudia was handed sort of handed to me. And I was like, I'm I'm taking this because I'm working with Claudia Fleming. Like that was I, I didn't care about the restaurant. It was a two hour commute one way just to go out to work with her. Did that for an entire year. Um, but because I was working for Claudia Fleming and I learned so, so much just from observing her. And I say this all the time. I think one of the reasons she's the best mentor is because she doesn't know how much of an impact she's had on my life and my career. 
those are the really great mentors, the ones who have just taught us things just by being themselves, you know, unapologetically you kind of deal. So all of those things I did because I knew what I, I sort of wanted my business to be, but I also didn't set these parameters for myself. When, I, when we started the bed and breakfast, it was just that. It was just a B and B. Then the necessity for some catering kind of came into our laps. Yeah. The necessity yeah. for wholesale in my environment or in a little town came into our laps. You have to adapt adaptability, you have to be able to change. So if you say, I'm opening this bakery that's only doing this and nothing but, then you're going to crash. But if you open up this business with the idea of this is where I am now, and if the opportunity presents itself to try something else, I'll grant myself the permission to take that chance. And if it works, I'm going to run with it. If it doesn't work, I'm going to cut it off and shift gears and try something new. And so we wouldn't have been able to open our standalone bakery if we hadn't done the b and first, added the catering, added the couture wedding cakes, added a small little bake shop at the b and and then it just kind of kept on snowballing. And eventually, you know, one of these paths of life, sometimes the paths are unclear and we have to take a risk. And other times there is a billboard, bright neon signs, the heavens have opened up and you have a whole choreographed situation of the Rockettes pointing you this way. And you're like, well, I guess I better go. And so that's kind of how the bakery finally was. Then throw in all of the Food Network stuff while all that's happening. And you just have this cacophony of like, oh my gosh. I love it. I love it. Great, great advice. And, and it comes back to living in the moment. Um, ab- ab- absolutely. Let's talk about the sweet life of Steve. Obviously, <laughs> infectious personality. Um, quite articulate, um, passionate about life. It's, it's, it's even more evident when you watch your show, your YouTube show, The Sweet Life of Steve. There's the plug, Chef. Like and subscribe, um, like and subscribe. <laughs> like and subscribe. It's clear that you love baking and cooking and entertaining. And I quote, bronies are not a cake, bronies are brownies. Um, yes. I, I love that. I love that. Y- yet again, another pivot in your career was that an opportunity, YouTube? Uh, what, what about YouTube drew you in? What, and, 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 and we talked about the, the set and all that uh, previously, but what was it about YouTube that thought, wow, I mean, that's a long way from Broadway. <laughs> it, it is, and at the same time, it's right next door. Okay. Um, <laughs> the, the thing about YouTube is... It's the platform for you to tell your story the way you want to tell your story without Mm -hmm. interference from anything else. You know, um, of course it would be great to, you know, like work for a network and whatever, but I, I also understand that there's a business there, you know, you don't get to really be creatively expressive because there's a demographic that you have to fill in and the sponsors and the millions of other things, you know, you're just at the end, at the end of the day, you're kind of a trained monkey in front of a thing, just coughing out what you've been told to do. And I think YouTube was so much more, you know, attractive because it's like, that's my place to tell my story. And there will be an audience for that. There'll be people also that hate it. And that's fine. Click the next video. No one's twisting your arm or anything like that. So it was an opportunity to be unapologetically me and share my passion or or rather share my passion of, uh, you know, baking and just stupidity and everything with um, an audience. And but there's a, there's a lot more work that goes into it. Just, just some of, you know, the pausing, the editing, the, the funnies, the getting the camera just right, you know, and I've noticed that too, that, I, I mean, you're not hesitating. You're looking right into that camera. You know, you want your audience to eat you up, right? And, and that's not easy. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of branding, right? So this would be, this would be the question, right, for, for those who are aspiring to, to do something, to be influencers like that, right? Yeah. Any advice on creating your brand? Because I'm sure that needs to be consistent. That needs to be who you are, needs to be authentic, needs to be real, needs to be fun, right? But I imagine that's not easy. No, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> um, it is exhausting. I will say, uh, get some 
advice or, you know, guidance from like a professional source or whatever. So the sweet life of Steve is actually produced by a production company. Like that's not my cell phone camera. That's filming all that. We hired a production company that we happen to be very good friends with. Um, and it was an exercise for them because they actually produce documentary films and oh, we're sort okay. of like, we want a chance to step outside of our comfort zone and maybe kind of try something different and be able to sort of say, hey, we can also do this. So all of the animation and the underscoring and all that kind of stuff was all done by the production company. And we had lots of meetings about, I'd like it to kind of be like this. They're like, realistically, we can kind of do it like this. So I think if you want to play the long game, it's important to, you know, get some guidance from somebody who that's their industry. That's what they're there for. You know, um, you definitely need to be honest and true to yourself because being fake, just it, it reads immediately. And they click out. Yeah. And they click yeah. out. Yeah. And then the other thing I think is don't try to replicate something that's already out there. Be you, you know, be again unapologetically you because the world already has you know and everybody else the world doesn't have a steve because is there a i'm mi- it. It, it is there a milestone i imagine i mean a lot of work goes into a 25 second tiktok and and people are swiping 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 but before you know it a million views two million views can you get over your skis by worrying about you know, the end result versus just being in the moment and really getting it right for you first? I think, I think you have to do that. Um, You, there, you know, there is a marketability that kind of has to go out there. You have to sort of understand what your lane is. You know, that's where the things like the appropriate hashtag comes into play, you know, whatever, what's trending, what's tracking. Um, There is all sorts of data about when is the best time of day to post, there's the, all of these algorithms now and kind of you have to understand how that works oh, that's in order to yeah. kind of catch the wave. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, Put yourself so, in a good position. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, it's not just about like coughing something out, but it's coughing something out at the, at the correct time with the correct search engine optimized, whatever's that's, you know, hashtags, all that business, tagging people, getting it in front of already influencers that can kind of help fast track it. Um, I think ultimately that was a bit of the demise of the success of Sweet Life of Steve. We had hoped that it would track a lot more, but it was launched at a very bad news cycle time where all of the, you know, all the stuff that out was out there was just sort of inundating everything. So you couldn't kind of crack through the noise. Yeah. Yeah. Timing is everything. Timing really is everything. And then also not getting like too super hung up about it. You know, at the end of the day, we created it because I wanted to create it and have the opportunity to tell my story. If 12 bazillion people hear my story, fantastic. But if 12 people hear my story and they're really touched by that, that's also pretty super that, amazing. That works well. too. Yeah. That's a good way to approach life too. So, you, and we're fortunate, uh, let me say, first and foremost, uh, that you're with us at Escoffier. You've been an instructor for us for some time now. And, and it's really important, um, you know, from my position that, that our instructors, uh, our mentors, you know, have this real world experience in, in whatever field it's in, right, uh, to share their stories, right, to be a great storyteller, because I I believe, and I'm sure you do, that it enriches a student's education um, to hear those stories, right? And h- how do you bring your life experiences, your advice, your ups, your downs into the classroom to try to, do you have to, do you have to measure every class before you go a certain route? I kind of go into each class with like, these are the things that I want to talk about. I've been fortunate enough, you know, I've been teaching cakes, especially for a while right now. So I already kind of understand where the ebbs and flows in the material are. I know what week is sort of traditionally a little bit more challenging for students than, you know, another week might be. So I kind of like, I prep them. I sort of say, this is what we're getting into. And I'm, I'm honest and real with them. You know, I, I don't, uh, you know, I don't try to be somebody else. 
uh, you know, I conduct myself with a sense of decorum, but I also am, I crack 80s references left, right, and center, because of course that's my time. You know, whenever I uh, am going to like put my screen up, I share my screen. You know, I just have <laughs> Chef Steve isms. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know, like humor is beautiful. Humor's humor is great. beautiful. Yeah. Um, I cry with my students a lot. My week six uh, um, inevitably is, and I tell them, I'm like, bring the Kleenex because we're going there. And I really open up to them. <laughs> I talk to them about how proud I am of them and their accomplishments. My heart breaks for so many of these students because they're, they're all on their own. You know, this is not like, again, in this online forum that we have, they have the luxury of being able to do things in their own space in their own time. And they have the hardship of carrying the burden of everything by themselves. And so many of them are either embarrassed or ashamed or scared to kind of reach out for help. And the amount of phone calls and messages I get about this, that, and whatever, the, the, you know, emotionally, I did not know mm -hmm. the gravity of the the burden of trying to be the mentor that each one of these amazing people deserves and meeting each one of them where they are in their journey at that specific time is a real emotional toll. And I am so fortunate that many students let me in to their personal struggles and I want to reach out and I want to shake some of them and be like, you don't have to do this alone. Just because the, the setting is you're by yourself, you're not by yourself. And I try to make it so apparent to them that I will be your champion and I will stand in the corner and I will root for you until the end of time. And when everything else feels like the world is collapsing around you, you just have to know that Chef Steve is on your side. And maybe, maybe that one little thought is just enough to go, I'm going to keep going. Or maybe it's enough to say, I need to stop. I need to rest. I need to take a pause. I need to gain the strength and energy that I need in order to go over this next barrier. And what I tell them all the time is when life feels challenging, look at everything that you have overcome to get to exactly where you are now and realize you and you alone did that. You had outside help, maybe you even had divine inspiration, but at the end of the day, you're the one that made the decision to take the next step forward. Then you grant yourself the permission to go, no, I'm gonna keep on going. Cause that has been my journey. And I want them to know that no matter what the world throws at you, you can overcome it because of everything that you've overcome to this point. And I get asked all the time, do you regret, right? The thing, the bullying, the, the lack of support, the everything. No. If I could go back and talk to five-year-old Steve, I would just tell him that there is a huge amount of adversity facing you, a lot of self-doubt, a lot of everything but trudge through the crap because it is going to be worth it. And you're going to become the person, you know, this amazing person because of all of that adversity. So now when adversity comes to me, I don't wallow in self-pity. I don't wish it away. I stare it down the face and say, bring it on. You think that this is, I've coughed up scarier things than you. So like, you know, beautifully, beautifully said, I, we're fortunate to have you. Our students are fortunate to have you. Tony, Tony would be proud as I am. Um, thank you. Thank you for that, Chef. Um, I, I have to ask the question because Colette kind of teed it up. <laughs> Baking, art or science? <laughs> so I think baking itself is 100% science. I'm, I'm, I'm going to disagree with Colette a little bit. She's probably going to find me afterwards and we're going to have fisticuffs in the parking lot. I love it. <laughs> I'm going to disagree with Colette. Baking is 100% science. Presentation is 100% art with a science chaser because you can't present things unless you understand the technique that is needed to present it. 
but you have to let the artistic side um, take over at some point. Uh, so I think that the act of baking is 100% science. And I think the act of presentation is like 95% art with a science chaser. I brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. I'm calling Wikipedia. We're <laughs> changing it tonight. We're changing it tonight. One final question. The name of the podcast chef is the ultimate dish. You can say anything you want could be dinner around the table with the family, but in your mind, what is the ultimate dish? God. Another tough, tough question. That's the <laughs> hardest question of all. Um, <laughs> the ultimate dish. I think the ultimate dish, and I'm just going to kind of more speak maybe metaphorically instead of being like pasta. Um, I think the ultimate dish has to have a bit of uh, maybe a side of food nostalgia, a uh, main course or, or, you know, a main, a main component of where you are right now and a dessert of what is yet to come. And I think that is a representation of exactly where you are in the present moment. And so whatever that might be for yourself, um, I think that that's the ultimate dish, having something to reflect on where you've been and the joys that have carried you to where you are at this point, a big helping of where I am right now and a finisher of what is yet unexplored and um, uh, untasted and um, just riding, just ride that, you know, ride that and relish every single bite of it. I am absolutely not surprised by your response <laughs> at all. And I absolutely love it. Calling Wikipedia on that as well. The Sweet Life of Steve. Chef, thank you so much. This has been emotionally beautiful. I, I really appreciate your time and I hope you come see us again. Thank you so, so much for having me. I was so excited from the moment that we reached out and said, hey, would you be interested? Of course, of course, I would be interested in a part of. Thanks everybody for watching and listening. Uh, thank you again, Chef, for, for your being such a gracious host and allowing me an opportunity to just give a teaspoon to coin, you know, because I take everything now in, in, uh, in culinary measurements to give just a little, well, probably about a tablespoon and a half really of, of, of some of my story. and. Um, you know, granting everyone, granting all of us here at the hallowed halls of Escoffier the opportunity to share our dish with you. Absolutely perfect. And thank you for sharing the spotlight. <laughs> thank you for listening to the Ultimate Dish Podcast brought to you by Auguste Escoffier School of Culinary Arts. Visit escoffier.edu forward slash podcast, where you'll find any materials mentioned during the podcast, including notes, links, and other resources. You can also browse other episodes and subscribe.